Thanks for joining us for this look at the best original reporting from KPBS News this week. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Coming up, a two-part KPBS investigation. Hear from a family that's suing Rady Children's Hospital over secret surveillance inside a hospital room. Where are the hotspots for parking tickets in San Diego? KPBS sorted through years of data to find out. And the start of a new soccer tradition in San Diego. See how our new MLS team will include Native American land and culture to grow future stars. It's been a busy week for our KPBS investigations team. Our first story dives into the new ownership of the San Diego Union Tribune. Amitha Sharma says those with questions about the newspaper's future can look to neighboring counties for some answers. Sitting outside a sandwich shop on a recent fall afternoon, Riverside resident Robbie Short says he's a regular voter, but he never reads the local newspaper, the Press Enterprise, before voting. In same fact, thing. he does no research at all. I always see the same names most of the time. And uh, if I see a new name, I'll look them up, or I won't even look them up and I'll just vote for the new name, because why not? Former Riverside Mayor Ron Loveridge says the press enterprise used to matter a lot more to residents. He recalls a time more than a decade ago when people in the community and elected officials read the local paper first thing in the morning. I'd be surprised if anybody at City Hall looks at the press enterprise now. Today, the newsroom that once employed more than 100 journalists covering all of Riverside County is now down to a handful of reporters. In 2016, the New York-based hedge fund Alden Global Capital bought the press enterprise. A significant number of those cuts have happened since then. The watchdog function is not there. The information function is not there. We are an explicit example of the kind of disappearance of local news. This July, Alden acquired the San Diego Union Tribune. There are already signs that the Union Tribune is likely following in the footsteps of the Press Enterprise and other Alden newspapers. Buyouts, layoffs, bare bones local coverage. Hours after Alden announced it bought the Union Tribune, the company offered buyouts. Journalists left with decades of community memory of corruption cases, courts, public safety, and politics. Loveridge says this leaves communities divorced from the give and take of formulating policy and from democracy itself. In American politics, access is local. It is not at the state, it's not at the federal level, it is local. The absence of information makes this democratic conversation locally uh, uh, almost non-existent. The Orange County Register is another cautionary tale. 20 years ago, the paper had hundreds of journalists covering San Diego's neighbor to the north. Frank Mikadite worked as a reporter, editor, and columnist for the Register. He says its mission was to saturate the county with news coverage. We had, you know, an investigative team, and we just poured a lot of money into, and, and resources in, into just every corner of journalism that existed and that we tried to invent. And it was exciting to be part of that. Alden bought the register in 2016. Now, sources at the paper say one reporter has to cover as many as five big cities. Consider a recent scandal at Anaheim City Hall. Details didn't come to light until the city released its own investigative report. And what's kind of scary about it is that we found out about Anaheim but who knows how many other Anaheims are out there? Um, you know, we don't know. And we may never know. Lifelong Anaheim resident Cynthia Ward says now the public must grapple with the consequences. When corruption goes unchecked, it means that money that should be coming into our communities is going into the pockets of special interests which means our taxes have to go up to fill potholes and do the things that we count on because of that money has been siphoned off. So ultimately we pay. Mikadite says the entire country, the very republic is in trouble if local news coverage continues its downward slide. But he does not begrudge Alden or other private equity firms for hollowing out newsrooms. They do what they do and it's like blaming a shark for doing what a shark does. I mean, it's just...
He says we're all to blame for letting it happen. Amita Sharma, KPBS News. Alden Global Capital did not respond to calls and emails seeking comment for this story. In response to previous KPBS coverage, a company spokesperson objected to Alden being described as a hedge fund. Rady Children's Hospital secretly surveilled a bedridden teenager and her parents using at least one hidden camera in a hospital room, and it was done without a warrant. That's according to a lawsuit filed by the family. KPBS investigative reporter Scott Rod spoke with the family in this two-part investigation. Bill Meyer and Dana Gasky are shuffling through a thick file of photos, letters, and drawings from their daughter Madison Meyer's childhood. The papers are fanned out on the dining room table of the family's Carlsbad home. Hi, Dad. How are you doing? I hope you have a great birthday with extra smiles. Thanks for putting up with me on my shoulder this year, even if it was tough. I loved you so much, Madison. And she drew the family. Um, on all of her fingers and Olive and our other dog, Scouty. It looks like a scrapbook of keepsakes, but it's not. It's actually a collection of exhibits from the parents' legal battle to retain custody of Madison. Our attorneys had just asked us that if, um, to pull together um, some pictures in case we were needing to have them uh, in trial. For nearly a year, in 2019 and into 2020, Gasky and Meyer could only visit their daughter a couple times a week in the hospital as they fought with San Diego County in juvenile dependency court. The county and a few employees at Rady Children's Hospital suspected the parents were harming Madison and interfering with her treatment. It's known as medical child abuse, or Munchausen syndrome by proxy, and it poses a serious risk of death to child victims. The parents proved their innocence and regained custody of Madison. But it emerged during the dependency trial that Rady had been secretly surveilling the family in Madison's private hospital room while the county conducted its investigation. The family alleges the surveillance went on for nearly 40 days, but captured no evidence of abuse. It, w it was horrific. It was a nightmare. They tore our family apart. They literally tore our family apart. Gasky and Meyer are currently suing Rady and the county in federal court. Rady declined an interview request and would not comment on the Meyer family's case, citing patient privacy protections. The county also declined an interview request, but emphasized that social workers are required by law to report and investigate suspected child abuse. Madison is now 20 years old. She's filed a similar lawsuit in state court and is represented by the same team of attorneys. She declined to be interviewed, but agreed to let her parents tell the family's story. Madison was an active kid growing up. I mean, she wanted to try everything uh, that she could. It was always about wanting to try soccer and then wanting to do gymnastics. But this typical youthful exuberance came with unusual injuries. Between the ages of 9 and 12, she broke her foot, both wrists, and a finger, and also required knee surgery. And then Madison dislocated her shoulder at a surf camp. That marked a turning point for her health. The shoulder never healed properly and kept dislocating. She had a lot of pain. She was having tr trouble um, with subluxing a lot. It would actually come out of the socket sometimes. She was putting it back in. And we had uh, seen several people in orthopedics trying to figure out what to do with all this. Doctors eventually diagnosed her with a genetic connective tissue disorder called hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Madison had shoulder surgery, but the problems persisted. At her middle school graduation, she delivered a speech wearing an elaborate sling wrapped around her shoulder. Thank you, Ms. Coy, for being everything to me at school, and thank you especially to my parents. You, I'm only successful because of you and the backpack you filled with supplies. Thank you. After a second reconstructive shoulder surgery, doctors gave her another diagnosis, complex regional pain syndrome. They urged Gasky and Meyer to enroll their daughter in an inpatient pain management program. She suffered. Um, she would talk to me about, uh, you know, mom, make this pain go away. And as a parent, when you hear that, you, you're like, how, how have we done everything to, that's out there? Meanwhile, the diagnoses kept piling up. 
By age 15, Madison had spells of dizziness from a nervous system disorder. Later, she would suffer from seizures and for a while needed a feeding tube. She kept saying, is there something that can be done? You know, I, I want to be like other kids. I want to be able to do fun stuff. Gasquet and Meyer contacted specialists around the country, desperately searching for answers. But they'd soon have a new fight on their hands, trying to keep custody of Madison. Scott Rod, KPBS News. Here's when she played in the band. Madison Meyer's health was failing as she entered her teenage years. By age 15, the formerly active child was admitted to the hospital with serious complications from a connective tissue disorder and required a feeding tube. Her parents, Bill Meyer and Dana Gasky, had crisscrossed the country looking for doctors who could help explain her condition. Obviously, as a parent, you, you hate standing by and seeing your child suffer. But they'd soon be fighting just to keep custody of Madison. Because in late 2018 and early 2019, according to court documents, San Diego County's child abuse hotline received two phone calls. They alleged Gasky and Meyer had abused their daughter by claiming she suffered from non-existent injuries and interfering with hospital staff. It's known as medical child abuse, or Munchausen syndrome by proxy, and it poses a serious risk of death to child victims. Gasky and Meyer categorically deny abusing their daughter. When a county social worker showed up in Madison's hospital room, her father was stunned. It was like, what, what, what is this? What does this mean? But the county is required to investigate any credible allegations of abuse. Around this time, Madison's medical team planned to transfer her to Rady Children's Hospital for round-the-clock care. Before Madison arrived, the county investigator contacted Dr. Shailen Nino, a lead child abuse pediatrician at the Children's Hospital. In a court filing, Nino said she reviewed Madison's medical file and, quote, admits she recommended Madison be monitored in a room with video surveillance as a medical diagnostic tool to determine whether Madison was a victim of medical child abuse. The Meyer family alleges the county reviewed the plan to secretly monitor Madison, but never obtained court approval for the surveillance. They had already planned to do the video. Um, there wasn't any intentions of being collegial and uh, involving us as a family. Nino's attorneys did not respond to multiple requests for comment. San Diego County declined an interview request. In an email, a spokesperson said no county employees were involved in the decision to surveil Madison's hospital room, even though Nino confirms in a court filing that she communicated with the main county investigator about Madison's care throughout the investigation. Rady declined an interview request and would not comment on the Meyer family's case, citing patient privacy protections. In an emailed statement, the hospital said, quote, our top priority is providing the highest level of care to our patients and families. By the time Madison arrived at Rady, at least one hidden camera was rolling. All of these people were standing in the corner because all of them knew exactly what was going on. They all knew exactly that we were being recorded. The county brought its child abuse case against Gasky and Meyer to juvenile dependency court. Madison was removed from her parents' custody during the 11-month trial. It was only during the custody battle that the family learned about the secret video surveillance. This video spanned the whole room. It covered everything. Every interaction Bill and I had with Madison, every personal moment. The worst part was I gave Madison baths. Every day I cleaned her up every day, changed her gown every day. All of that was on the video. It was horrific. 38 days. That's how long the covert surveillance lasted, the Meyer family alleges in their lawsuit. After the legal battle, the juvenile dependency court awarded Meyer and Gasky custody of Madison. The Meyer family's lawsuit quotes the San Diego County Superior Court Commissioner, who ruled in their favor. He allegedly criticized the extensive use of covert surveillance, calling it, quote, an unbelievable invasion of privacy, an insensitive invasion of privacy. Hospitals have used covert surveillance to investigate many suspected cases of Munchausen by proxy in recent decades. But there is sharp disagreement among medical professionals and legal experts about the practice. On the face of it, it's both unethical and unnecessary. Michael Flannery is a distinguished professor of law at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. 
Flannery reviewed the Meyer family's complaint and says the allegations troubled him. It struck me as uh, just violative of the family's Fourth Amendment right to privacy. Flannery acknowledges that hospitals can generally use surveillance throughout their facilities, but when hospitals work in cooperation with the government, he argues, the Fourth Amendment almost always requires court approval. A judge has dismissed parts of the Meyer family's federal lawsuit, but has allowed it to proceed on several claims, including on Fourth Amendment grounds. Some child abuse experts say surveillance plays an essential role in diagnosing Munchausen by proxy cases. I'm an advocate for all the tools that we could possibly use that could help us protect children from this. Beatrice Yorker is a professor emerita of nursing and criminal justice at California State University, Los Angeles. She encourages hospitals to develop clear protocols when using surveillance. The Meyer family says that's one of their goals. Beyond seeking monetary damages, they're hoping Rady establishes clear safeguards for conducting surveillance in the future. They've done a lot of good things in the community. It's not about how much good you've done in the past, but how much you're willing to continue to challenge yourself to get better and make it better for your patients. Scott Rod, KPBS News. And our investigations and feature reporting are available on the KPBS YouTube page. Subscribe and get notifications for new content as it's posted. That's also where we live stream KPBS Evening Edition weeknights at 5. A San Diego-based Navy SEAL who's become a prominent leader against LGBTQ plus rights at school board protests throughout Southern California is under investigation by the service over his alleged affiliations with extremists, including the Proud Boys hate group. KPBS military reporter Andrew Dyer has the story. Chief Special Warfare Operator Bryce Henson has participated in at least a dozen political rallies across Southern California in the last 16 months, speaking often at city council and school board meetings in association with extremist groups as part of their anti-LGBTQ movement. In public statements and under false names, Henson has claimed he's a veteran. In truth, he's an active-duty Navy SEAL assigned to the Naval Special Warfare Training Command in Coronado. And his activism, including alleged associations with members of the Proud Boys, is now under investigation by the Navy. A Naval Special Warfare spokesperson in Coronado tells KPBS they've launched an investigation into allegations one of their sailors violated the military's policy against participation with or supporting extremist causes. An anti-fascist researcher who asked KPBS not to use their name says they reported Henson to his commanders this week and provided a collection of video and photographic evidence of him at rallies with alleged members of hate groups, including the Proud Boys. Photos and video both captured and viewed by KPBS show Henson shoulder to shoulder at rallies with alleged extremists. One has a Proud Boy tattoo, another a large Nazi tattoo on his head and a swastika on his arm. Henson couldn't be reached for comment through his attorney. Andrew Dyer, KPBS News. And that was one of our most popular stories this week at kpbs.org. And here is another. Katerina Portella analyzed years of city data to find out where people are most likely to get a parking ticket in San Diego. In the three weeks that I've lived here, I think I've gotten about maybe six or seven. If you run upstairs to do something, you come right back downstairs, you get a ticket right there, right away. I've been ticketed like six times in the past month. Parking tickets are a fixture of life in San Diego, and most San Diegans have parking ticket stories of their own. In the past 10 years, the city of San Diego has handed out more than 5 million parking citations, totaling $300 million. Wondering what the most common day to get a parking ticket is? It's Thursday. Thursdays received 19% of all citations in the last decade. On the other hand, the least common day is Sunday, which only received 2% of all citations. The most common citation was violating street sweeping signs, with 1.1 million citations and $60 million in fines. There is an extreme amount. Mission Beach resident Kane Holloway says the fear of tickets structures his day. He's a tattoo artist and has to work on one tattoo for hours at a time. And he doesn't have employee parking. It's very inconvenient to have to like leave where I am to go move my car so I don't get a ticket. Beachside areas across the city, like the neighboring Pacific Beach, also are high on the list for citations. Both Mission and Pacific Beaches parking 
is mostly metered or only available for limited times. But metered parking actually helps businesses. So says Sunny Lee, executive director of Discover Pacific Beach. The businesses really want to see people turning over in the parking spaces that are right in front of their businesses, which is why the parking meters are going in, because then it allows for more visitors to those businesses. The most common citation, almost a quarter, was for violating street sweeping signs. And a big chunk comes from Mission Beach. During the past 10 years, the city collected $65,000 in street sweeping tickets just on Mission Boulevard. And that could increase even more in the coming years. Last May, the city announced it would increase the frequency of its street sweeping in Mission Beach from three days to four. Mission Beach resident Bear Stoy got a ticket, but says he rarely sees street sweepers. I'm just bummed, you know? I gotta pay off student loans and I have other, other bills to pay and you know, seeing all those tickets, it just doesn't really help out with that. I don't see too much street sweeping going on. I see the parking ticket guys out a lot, but that's about it. Just because they don't see the street sweeper doesn't mean that it's not gonna come through. Jose Isaya is a spokesperson for the city. We need to be able to make sure that we have a predetermined uh, time where all those uh, cars are gonna be cleared so that we can go in and, and sweep those streets. Isaya says money from parking citations goes into the city's general fund, which pays for public libraries, parks, and even parking enforcement. Gaslam Quarter boasts some of San Diego's most iconic nightlife, restaurants, and events. It also boasts the streets with the greatest number of parking tickets. Over the past decade, Fifth Avenue has been the top place to receive a ticket at a meter. The city collected nearly $1 million from expired meter citations on Fifth Avenue alone. But this might be changing. Since COVID, the city blocked off portions of Fifth Avenue to cars, creating the Gaslamp Promenade. That could mean fewer parking tickets as well. Michael Trimble is executive director of the Gas Lamp Quarter Association. Before, it was a lot of people driving up and down Fifth Avenue looking for that magic spot that they could never find. And so really, with all the parklets that we had, you know, all up and down Fifth Avenue, we only took away 30 spaces. Mm -hmm. So with the removal of those 30 spaces on Fifth Avenue, we've tried to add spaces on 4th Avenue, on 6th Avenue, and then on the cross streets. So the rest of downtown could have the same number, if not more, parking violations. That means San Diegans will likely continue to have their days ruined by a little slip of paper on their windshields. For KPBS, I'm Katerina Portella. Volunteers spent part of their week giving some TLC to ecologically sensitive land in North County. Environment reporter Eric Anderson tells us how that hard work will benefit a nearby lagoon and help local climate efforts. Volunteers repaired fences, planted native plants, and placed oyster wattles near a hiking trail to control erosion. Jeremiah Cooper pulled stubborn invasive weeds along the shore. It's a little bit stuck right now. I'm just trying to like Pull up the gypsum weed from this rock. The Agua Hedionda Lagoon has a narrow opening to the ocean. Roads cross it in three places, and Carlsbad homes are built very close to the water. The urban pressure is intense, but boosters are looking to build public appreciation. The biggest concern is just the amount of traffic and the misuse of the lagoon. We are uh, big proponents of active use and um, balanced use and making our future generations aware that they need to protect, conserve, and be the best stewards so that those future generations can enjoy this use. But this lagoon can also play a role in fighting climate change. Locals have already noticed the rising sea levels, and ecologists see preservation of the lagoon's natural systems as a valuable hedge against a warming planet. Wildco says lagoons and wetlands can store two to five times more carbon than terrestrial ecosystems. When you have these areas surrounding lagoons, we call them transition zones, where as sea level rises, salt marsh can migrate upward into these areas. And even when they become submerged or intertidal, they still act as functioning, healthy salt marsh ecosystems. This immediate restoration work has immediate impacts, but everyone is also keeping an eye on climate change and what will happen here in the future. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. Team USA soccer stars Megan Rapino and Ali Krieger will wrap up their careers this weekend in San Diego during the NWSL championship game. A few miles to the east, a new generation of soccer talent will get their start. Melissa May shows us where San Diego's new MLS team is planting roots.
The groundbreaking ceremony opened with a series of bird songs that are a part of the Sequan Band of the Kumeyaay Nation's oral history. Bring that part to the ceremony and, and start our event today with our cultural traditions. It's, it just means the world to us and to the Sequan people. Tribal Chairman Cody Martinez is San Diego FC's vice chairman and says the facility is being built on sacred ground. Uh, Kumeyaay village of Matomo. The history is here. You could feel the history in this land. And so I think our partners in Right to Dream and the Mansours recognize that from the beginning. Club chairman Mohammed Mansour says they are the first major soccer club to build a training facility on Native American land. The 28-acre project includes five training fields and a sports performance center for both the first team and academy teams. But we can't wait to be able to infuse Kumeyaay culture and help foster the growth of all of these young men and women that are going to come through this academy. This will also be home to the Right to Dream Youth Development Academy with a fully funded school, residences and soccer academy. Major League Soccer Commissioner Don Garber says this club is not your typical expansion team. When you think about what this facility is, which is different than all others, it's global in nature. It has residences that have already been built, and it's a boys and girls academy. San Jose Earthquakes forward Useni Buda is one of the Right to Dream Academy's success stories. He was recruited as a child in Burkina Faso. Right to Dream is, um, is a mentality, um, and there's an energy about Right to Dream that stays with you uh, for the rest of your life. San Diego FC leaders say they will also be the first MLS club to develop young female talent in their academy. The club expects to enroll the first academy recruits in the fall of 2025. Melissa May, KPBS News. We hope that you enjoyed this look at KPBS News this week. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Thanks for joining us.